stronger together, which is why we take time to share like that. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm blessed every time. I truly am. Uh, you're in for a treat today because I'm not preaching. That, that, that's good news. It's okay. You can, you can agree. Um, no, I'm actually really, really excited because I've got three people that are sharing today and my role is really just to facilitate, but, uh, but to set it up for you so you understand why I'm doing this. Um, one of the disciplines that happened in our church through lockdown was that we started gathering in an online meeting to pray. And during the first lockdown, where none of us knew which way was up and what was happening, we just thought we were on holiday, uh, we actually prayed twice a day in an in a online prayer room. Uh, we used Zoom in those days, and we prayed, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., and it was really powerful. And uh, it's, it's different to get used to praying in an online prayer meeting. It's very different. But once you get used to it, it's amazing. And what developed out of that is a discipline whereby we only pray Scripture. Uh, no, we don't only pray Scripture. We use Scripture as a guide for our prayer. And we pray through a chapter, a specific chapter. We believe prayer meetings are to be led by the Holy Spirit and the Lord appoints someone to lead that prayer meeting and we all follow the leader. So uh, that's an in-person prayer meeting or an online prayer meeting. And so what happened in the middle of June, we, oh, sorry, we pray on a Monday night at 7 p.m. and it's advertised on our Facebook page, it's advertised in our email, you're welcome to join. We use Microsoft Teams, uh, which you can just get in a web browser or on your phone. If you need help, we can help. Uh, and we pray for one hour. And we also pray on Thursday morning. And we're just trialing a different time of the day. This week we prayed at 9 a.m. instead of 7 a.m. And um, we're not sure if that's going to work. But twice a week we meet online to pray. And what, what's become so powerful for me and the elders as the leaders of the church, what, let me speak for me, what I have found is a, a new level of clarity in the leadership for the direction of the church that comes out of these prayer meetings. And it's because someone will share something, pray something out of a verse that just strikes us. The journey that we're on right now to come from 1310 Racecourse Road to here, we've called Crossing Over. And it came out of a prayer meeting in May 2020 when we prayed Joshua 3. We felt the Lord say, you're going to begin crossing over. Get yourself ready. You will see the Lord do wonders amongst you. The first thing you need to do is consecrate yourself. And so for the last three years, we've been on this crossing over duty, but, but it came out of Scripture. Some of the stuff that's happened recently in the eldership strategies we're doing have come out of Scripture that's in a prayer meeting where the Lord speaks through the Spirit, but in the unity and the agreement of those that are present. Uh, and we take notes. Uh, Marge, thank you. Uh, she's dutiful and diligent in her note-taking because we want to capture what God's saying. So in the middle of June, we're having a prayer meeting, and we, I, I was leading, so I decided we were going to pray Joshua chapter 6. So if you've got your Bibles, that's where you're going to be today. Joshua chapter 6. And as we were praying through Joshua chapter 6, verse by verse, declaring what God was saying in His Word, coming into agreement with the Spirit, and then listening to what the Spirit would say to us in that space, we really felt quite strongly that we were coming to the end of our crossing over season, but there were key things the Lord was saying to us through this passage. And as I reflected on the notes, I felt quite stirred that we would need to share them with you because uh, most of you weren't in that prayer meeting that day, that specific day. And so rather than me do it, in line with uh, what we like to do here as, a, as, as include others, is I just chose three people who were in that prayer meeting, present that day, to be able to share one of each of the three aspects uh, from Joshua chapter 6. And uh, that's the setup. And what I'm going to do is introduce Marge, who's going to come and speak first. And then I'll just facilitate between the three speakers. And uh, then we've got a song to finish with. So Marge, thank you for being part of this. Well, he said most of what I was going to say, but never mind. Oh, whatever. <laughs> okay, so I'll just set up. Chapter 5, verse 15, says that there's an encounter 
with um, Joshua and the um, oh got you yeah uh, the commander of the Lord's army. So there's an encounter there. Chapter six opens and says that the city is shut. No one's going in. No one's going out. It's a well fortified city too. Um, that's because they had heard of the Israelite army. So in the next few verses, um, I'm just overviewing what it says. Um, the Lord speaks to Joshua. He assures him of victory at this battle. He gives him strategy. He's got a detailed timeline. He instructs them to tell the priests to use a trumpet. That's a weapon of war. He explained the results of what will happen. The walls will fall. And how to proceed from this point. So Joshua goes to his people and he relays the instructions to the, the priests and the people and they obeyed him. In verse 10, he commanded the people to make no noise. Verse 14, they marched around the city and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. Verse 15, on the seventh day, they got up early. Fancy that. <laughs> to do it seven times on that same day. Verse 16, Joshua told them to shout for the Lord had given them the city. And verse 20, the walls fell down and they went in. So, he had a, obedient priests and um, soldiers. So, let's see what you're like. Are you ready? Stand. Pretty cool. Sit down. Oh, look at that. Now, you see, I was looking during the worship, and, you know, armies are full of able-bodied people, all right? And I saw nobody sitting down during the worship, so I know you can all do it again. Stand. Wow. Raise your right arm. I raise my left because I'm holding this. <laughs> okay, lower it. Sit down. Put it down now. Oh. Stand up. Raise your left arm. Put it down. Sit down. Okay, you all did pretty well. Pretty well indeed. But there was a little bit of confusion at one point. I heard a couple of, what? What? <laughs> Somebody stood up, assuming what I said. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for those who said what. Because, you see, you couldn't hear, could you? Is that because you weren't listening? No. <laughs> Were you focused on something else that was distracting you? No. Did you get tired and lose interest? No. Could you see this wasn't going anywhere and you were starting to get impatient and frustrated? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you all started well, as I said, but where was the perseverance? Where was the pressing in? A couple of people said what? One assumed. But listen, if we don't hear God, where can we go? What can we do? Do we just make up our own mind? Do we just assume? Or do we still go back and press in again? Jeremiah 33, 30, uh, 3, 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I will. I will. God says I will. He means I will answer you. And I will tell you great and mighty things. So here's a what if situation. What if Joshua had decided to ignore the commander of the Lord's army? Or what if Joshua had said to God, huh, yeah, right, I'm going to look like a flipping idiot. Look, we're over the Jordan. I've had enough. I'm finished. What if the priest had said, Go jump in the Jordan, Joshua. <laughs> what if the people had said, what's the point of all this nonsense? In silence? Are you kidding me? Have you seen the size of this city? What would the outcome have been then? So, our first step is to go to God. We've heard that already this morning. Yeah, he is first and foremost for everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly, from your coffee with Phil. <laughs> Everything. Because we need to know we are in sync with God. We need to know we're doing what God wants. Are we in the wrong place? We need an answer. Do we have the wrong people around us? Check that one out. 
Are we using the wrong weapons of war? Well, prayer is the first and foremost start of a relationship with God. So once we ask, then we must wait and listen. When we listen, there's a good chance we will hear. When we, can, when we hear, we can then obey if we choose to. But why would we stop on the sixth day? Why would we stop on the sixth time going around that city on the seventh day? Why would we fall short? Why would we not press in for that last little bit? Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14 lists many blessings for those who obey. This is where Phil's already told you all. <laughs> but I'll say Matthew 18, 9 to 20. I'll just read it. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Right. Now, Monday and Thursday, online, except for the first one in the hub here on the first Monday. But it does not say where two or three stand and pray aloud for 45 minutes while everyone else listens. No, there's none of that. Don't be scared. You can come and all you have to say is, I agree. Just be there. Your presence yeah. is actually good. That's right. yeah. So do you ever wonder when you're praying, is this me? Is this just me? Or is the Lord actually speaking to me? Because in the prayer meetings, we hear others say something. We're, oh, do you know, I was thinking something like that. Yeah. And so then you get confidence to speak out. You get agreement yeah. in the word. Yeah. Your ears are strengthened yeah. Yeah. because you've heard someone else say it. Your faith is strengthened because, hey, I can hear God. Wow. We strengthen our confidence in God by attending the prayer meetings. I've heard prayer meetings called the furnace of the church. So if you want to go on fire, kids, come along. Now, it is not an elite group. It's not elite. You are all what kings and priests. We're all royal priesthood. We're all elite. So you're all welcome. So now that we've crossed over here, we need strategies more than ever. Isaiah 43, 18, 19 says, forget the former things. It's gone. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new, new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? You can perceive with your eyes, but you can also perceive with your spirit. So how are we? What are we doing here? Where are we going? How are we going to affect this community? How are things going to change for the better? Because yeah. I don't think they're going to get worse, even though we've got some gremlins at the moment trying to make them worse. Did we cross over here just to sit in a seat? So those prayer meetings actually direct us. Just as Phil's already said, a lot of the things that the church is doing have come out of a seed planted in a prayer meeting. So I do believe today that God has great plans for Zion Hub for this town, for this region, for this nation. Yeah. I actually believe that. But you know what? Here's the crunch line. He needs us. Yeah. Every one of us. Yeah. Every one of us. He needs everyone to be part of his army. <clears throat> so my challenge to you today, are you willing to be part of God's army? Are you willing to put God first in your life, to come before him, the almighty God, to receive his instruction just as Joshua did, and then not ignore it like I hinted at, but actually carry it out and obey it? And I believe that we will all have victory if we would just pray, listen, and obey. Very good, very good. Um, if my people who are called by my name would harm themselves, mm, repent of their wicked ways, turn to me, seek my face, I will hear, says the Lord. Come on, Second Chronicles 7.14. Um, when I was sick, um, 
I don't want to get out of bed at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, well, less than I usually want, don't want to get out of bed. Um, <laughs> so um, my uh, beautiful home care provider would bring me a cup of tea uh, to me in bed, and um, I would have um, the prayer meeting open on my phone with the video turned off <laughs> and the sound turned off, so my microphone muted, but they could still, I could still hear what was happening, and I could still agree with what was being prayed. Andrea, you've done that a couple of times on your morning walks. You, when are you getting ready for work? Dial in on your phone and, and listen. Phil Brown often does it when he's driving to um, uh, Whakamaru. And Richard, before your work hours changed, you were doing the same. Uh, so all things are possible. Nigel, will you come and share? Thank you, friend. Good morning, church. Well, we've heard about obedience, and I was part of that prayer meeting, and what I have been given, uh, talking about is being quiet, and if you know me, <laughs> I'm a talker. <laughs> so I'm going to pose a question to you, and I want you to ask yourself this. Where am I positioning myself so that I am quiet enough to tune into God? I'm going to say the question again so you remember. Where am I positioning myself so that I am quiet enough to tune into God? Joshua 6.10, and Marge uh, mentioned this verse, says, Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then, the obedience part, then, and only then shall you shout. So why do we need to be quiet? And there's two reasons I believe we need to be quiet. We need to be quiet so God can speak. And Marge has talked about that. But we also need to be quiet so God can move. We need to be quiet so God can speak. But we need to be quiet so God can move. So, relating to the first point, being quiet so God can speak. In Joshua 6, the children of Israel had to be quiet to hear the instructions of what to do. Verse 3 told, tells us, March around the city once with armed men, do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with priests blowing the trumpets. While they were doing what they were doing, they had to be quiet so they knew when to take the next course of action. Being quiet, which is not being passive, being quiet, enabled them to enforce the Lord's victory. For when they heard the shout... on. A long blast on the trumpets, says verse 5. Have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. So you imagine this army wandering around. You imagine if they were chatting about the day, business of the day, you know. If it was happening today, they'd be talking about the all-black game last night. Yeah, yeah. Oh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know. But no, they would have not been quiet to hear what God wanted them to do. They would not be quiet to hear and enforce the Lord's victory. And as been said this morning, in our prayer meeting, we believe God speaks. And it was revealed to us in the prayer meeting that though the priests blew the trumpets, the people were quiet, and that as a church we need to be quiet before the Lord which is hard for people like me who like to talk, <laughs> and to thank God for his leading. Yeah. And I want to say that the people were active participants. They weren't doing nothing. They were not passive. They were actively engaged with what God was doing at the time. Yeah. He was leading them. They were marching around the city quietly yeah. so they could hear the sounds of the ram hordes to charge into the city. They didn't take the city on day one. They didn't take it on day two. 
They were quiet. They were doing what God had commanded them to do. And when they heard the command to shout, they shouted and they took the city and then they saw God move. And I want to highlight another verse of Scripture to just emphasize listening to God in the quiet. 1 Samuel 3.10 Then the Lord came and stood there. This is the Lord talking to Samuel. Calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So I'm not going to go into that story with detail, but it was in the quiet of the night, not the busyness of the day, that Samuel, who was actively listening, heard the voice of the Lord. It was in his active service to Eli the priest and to his listening quietly that the Lord, to the Lord that Samuel heard, and as much as said, obeyed. We all need to be quiet to hear God because God speaks to his body. And that's been said several times this morning. We're a part of that body. We see in our prayer meetings, I'm going to reiterate, that God speaks to us all, not just a select few. When I'm in a prayer meeting, I expect God to speak. Sometimes he gives me something to say. Sometimes he gives me a scripture to speak or pray. Yet at other times, as has been said this morning, Someone will say something under the the leading of the Holy Spirit and that will spark a verse in my mind. The Holy Spirit will bring a verse to my mind or enable me to say something because he's actually using us all. He's not just using the one or two or three. He's using us all. So we all as a body need to be actively engaged with what God is doing and that involves being Actively quiet before the Lord so we can hear him. We need to be quiet so God can speak. And the second point, being quiet so God can move. So when did God move in Joshua chapter 6? Well, we know he moved when the people shouted and God delivered the city of Jericho into their hands. However, God was moving before the power encounter. God was moving amongst the children of Israel as they quietly obeyed God's instruction and he was moving in the city of Jericho. Verse 3 talks about, they, you shall march around the city, you men of war. You shall go to th- around the city once. Do this for six days. Then seven priests with seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark But on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass that when they make long blasts on the ram's horns, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people will shout with a great shout. Then the walls of the city will fall down, and the people will go up, every man straight before him. So God was moving when the people were quiet and doing what he asked them to do. As the children of Israel marched around Jericho following the seven priests with seven ram horns, and seven, by the way, is the number of completion, this is us as a people with our praise and worship that ushers in the presence of God. There were the trumpeters, the praise, the worship. There was the ark, the presence of God that followed as they lifted up the name of Jesus. So I believe they exalted God in their activity and what they were doing. And by doing so, he was preparing them and the enemy for the power encounter to come. And then verse 20 says, So the people shouted and the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened that when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man before him. They took the city. So God was moving amongst the children of Israel. But even though God's word doesn't say what was happening in the Jericho city, God was moving in that city as well. So I want you to humor me just for one minute. Imagine you lived in Jericho, you've got a house on the wall of the city, 
you look down, there's children playing, there's adults doing their business, do, engaging with commerce, and then you see on the other side, you see these children of Israel walking around quietly. And that's not normally how invaders behaved. They ran to that city. They shouted, we're coming to get you. And there was noise and there was chaos. But not these guys walking around quietly. That's not what armies did in those days. Next day, they walked around quietly. And over the seven days, I believe those people got a sense of, oh, this feels a bit eerie. And by the time the seventh day had come, they're probably feeling a little bit freaked out. And then bef the trumpet sounded and the city was taken. So God prepared the, was working in the hearts of the children of Israel, but he was working in the hearts of the people of the city. And so I want to highlight another scripture that talks about being quiet so God can move. This is the children of Israel again. They were fleeing Egypt and they were being chased by the Egyptians and they complained to Moses. They were having a good moan to Moses. And Moses, under the influence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, said to them, and we can read it in Exodus 14, verse 14, he said, the Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. So God has asked us that it is the Lord who fights and wins our battles. And in the prayer meeting, the Lord revealed to us that it's the priests that blew the trumpets, the pe but the people were quiet, and that as a church, we need to be quiet and learn to be silent before the Lord and thank him for his leading. So we need to be quiet so God can speak. Do you want to hear God speak? I do. Do you want to be quiet so God can move? Do you want to see God move? Definitely, I want to see God move. So remember the scripture that I said at the beginning, Joshua 6 verse 10. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed from your mouth until the day I say to you, shout. Then you shall shout. And I want to add verse 20 here too. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a loud shout that the wall fell flat. They were obedient, weren't they? Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So back to my key question. Back to your key question. Where am I positioning myself so that I am quiet enough to tune into God? And tuning into God means we can hear him, but we are doing what he wants us to do. Where are we positioning ourselves so we are quiet enough to tune into God? Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much, mate. Um, thank you. One of the key themes that uh, is part of the story uh, became a theme for me in late 20, this before this year, whatever that is, um, is advance and occupy. And I'm going to speak about that in two weeks as the close of the series because I want you to understand, this is why I'm setting um, Louise up to come next, I want you to understand there's a reason God's leading us through this for the sake of our town. All right. It's not just so we have a new place to meet on a Sunday. And I need you to get that point, and I'm going to make it very clear in two weeks' time, three weeks' time. Louise, would you please come? Morning, everyone. I'm, talk I'm talking about strongholds. Can you imagine what it looked like for those Israelites? Walk they walked through the desert for 40 years. They've seen no buildings. And they come into the plains of Jericho and they see this huge city on a hill with two walls. Not one wall, two walls. In those days they reckon it was one of the first walled cities. So they, they probably didn't even have, have anything to 
to comprehend what they were looking at in the beginning. And the walls they say were the walls they say were 14 meters high from the ground level where where the Israelites were walking around and looking up. This is um, some facts I've got from Bible archaeology. The walls were wide enough that they could ride a horse and a chariot around them. And in the inner wall, there were actually houses built into the wall. So we're talking about really wide walls. So in the natural, how's this coming down? You know, even today, how's this going to come down? And I personally think that's probably one of the reasons why they had to keep quiet while they were walking (laughs) around the city because I think a lot of doubt would have crept into the people's hearts of how they were going to overcome what was facing them. In our days, strongholds are not fortified cities, but they're thoughts and beliefs that are contrary to God's word. They're even contrary to scientific facts. Just... And just like the first time when Moses sent the Israelites into the promised land, the the enemy is going to make us look at things in our society that are strongholds that look impossible to bring down. I want to challenge each one of you this morning to think about something that you've been faced in the past few months, the last couple of years, of things that you know are not a scientific fact that are being pushed on you, things that you know are not true to God's word that are being placed over and above what you believe and what the Bible says. And the enemy's main tactic is to make us fearful because fear makes us indecisive. It scrambles our brain so we can't make good choices. But the word says in Timothy, in, in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The word here for sound is machino, which actually means disciplined or controlled. So that's challenging because that actually means we have to control the way we think if we want to bring down strongholds. We can't just look at these things and go, ah. We have to get our thoughts into line with what God's word says and, and just let, let our minds become quiet and meditate on that word. Okay. In 2 Corinthians, verse 10, 4 to 5, the word says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the knowledge of God. In my words, that means speak God's word and expect him to do what he says. Are you ready to see the strongholds fall in this nation? It's like us walking around looking at those walls of Jericho thinking like, God, how how can we even communicate with people whose minds are so scrambled with fear that they can't think straight? How are we going to even speak your word into their lives when we're not even allowed to to quote Bible to them, especially in our children nowadays? But God prepares us for victory. And I, I, I found this so encouraging because right at the very beginning, before, before they even started wa- marching around the city, God was doing something. He was preparing the people of Jericho for their defeat because it didn't matter if the walls fell down. They would still have had to fight the people. You know, God did a wonderful miracle and the walls did fall down. But there were still people inside those walls, and we forget about that. In 
in the very beginning of the story of Joshua, when he sent two spies in, and I thought it was quite interesting that Moses sent 12 spies in and only two came back with a good report, and Joshua sent two spies in. (laughs) (laughs) So in in Joshua 2 verse 8, and this is Rahab speaking to the two spies. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us. Not the fear, the terror. And all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth below. Heaven on earth. Heaven. He is God in heaven above and on earth below. He's God on earth here. He's God on earth here. So I just want to challenge you to look at those strongholds differently today. Join us in the prayer meetings. Let us see those things that, we, that look impossible pulled down. We don't, have to, we don't have to bow to the enemy. Let's listen to what God's saying to us as, as a church today. So I'm just going to welcome you all to the prayer meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow night at 7 p.m. There'll be a link online. Um, would you stand? We're going to finish. Uh, we, but but um, we're going to finish with a song that um, I chose for the purpose of you having a proclamation on your mouth of the solution that you're part of. Because, because Louise is right. God's not sending one or two people out to, to do a good work. He's sending the, the church out to do the work to pull down the enemy strongholds and to see the kingdom of God advance in our nation, that lives will be transformed. But, that you know, Jesus didn't just say, go and preach the gospel. He said, go and disciple nations. Change society in line with the kingdom. And that's what I believe is our mandate as the church.